Good afternoon and welcome to part two of the Harvard Radcliffe Institute's programs on issues of climate change and climate justice in the humanities. Today's program will focus on the role of young adult literature, literature geared towards adolescents, in addressing climate change and literacy. A recording of the first program in the series, which was titled Revisiting Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sower in 2024, will also be posted to the Radcliffe website. Young adult literature is, as scholar Mark Oshwitz explains, predicated on the dream of justice. Works of YA, as the genre is affectionately called, represent issues of justice with vibrancy and vigor, orienting young readers towards reflection as well as action and activism. Our conversation today features a librarian and an author, two pillars of the YA genre, and considers how young adult literature can be leveraged to address climate change and catalyze climate justice in our modern age. My name is M.G. Prezioso, and I am a PhD candidate at Harvard's Graduate School of Education. My dissertation explores how kids experience the feeling of being lost or absorbed in a book and the implications of immersive reading for children's literacy development. In addition to my graduate work, I also write and publish picture books for children with chronic conditions and food allergies, a project that aims to empower kids in their diagnoses and destigmatize health conditions in childhood. Our first speaker today is Liz Phipps Suero, the director of Boston Public Schools Library Services and alumnus of Harvard's Graduate School of Education. Known as Liz the Librarian, she has been a strong and vocal advocate of inclusivity in children's and young adult literature. In addition to her work as a librarian and now a PhD student in urban education, leadership and policy, Liz is the founder of the Cambridge Book Bike, a collaboration of stakeholders who work toward growing the personal libraries of the children of Cambridge. Her writing has been featured in the School Library Journal, The Horn Book, and Embracing Equity, and she was named a School Library Journal's School Librarian of the Year and a Library Journal Mover and a Shaker in 2017. Welcome, Liz. Our second speaker today is Nigerian-American author Nnedi Okorafor, the winner of the Hugo Nebula World Fantasy Locus and Lodestar Awards, as well as the prestigious Wol Suyanka Prize for Literature. Nnedi has published several works, from her novella, Binti series, to her novels, Who Fears Death, Zara the Windseeker, Akata Witch, and Akata Warrior. She has also written comics and film, and one of her upcoming books, which is called Space Cat, is a graphic novel. Her writing has redefined the fantasy genre, and in addition to conjuring magical, mystical worlds filled with beauty, she also skillfully grapples with numerous justice issues, from environmental destruction and genocide to race and gender inequality. In addition to her lustrous creative writing career, Nettie also holds a master's degree in journalism and a master's and a PhD in English literature. Welcome, Nettie. Lastly, I am pleased to introduce our moderator, Stephanie Lemonager. Stephanie is the Barbara and Carlisle Moore Distinguished Professor of English and American Literature and a Professor of Environmental Studies at the University of Oregon. She is also a former Radcliffe Fellow. Her research, which can be explored in numerous articles and books, considers how the humanities can help us become more ecologically connected and how literature equips us to live with climate change. Additionally, she is developing a concept called H2OU, a university dedicated to thinking through the effects of drought on, as she writes, what humanity is and can aspire to become. Welcome, Stephanie. Today's program will engage our speakers in a conversation about literature and climate change. Towards the end, they will take questions from the audience. We encourage you to use the Q&A feature on Zoom to submit any questions that you may have, and they will answer as many of them as time permits. It is now my pleasure to turn the virtual floor over to Professor Stephanie Lemonager. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful and honored to be here. And thanks to all the cool women of Radcliffe who make this programming and climate justice possible from Dean Tomiko Brown-Nagan to Carol Oja and Becky Wasserman. 
Um, I, I'm just a huge fan of uh, Nettie Korafor, whose um, youth fictions as well as adult fictions have had profound effects on myself and my students. And I think we have really two heroes of climate justice here because we also have a librarian who is internationally known for creating access to books like Nadia Korafor's for her students across Cambridge uh, and elsewhere. So I wanted to start with a question that um, I think I'll direct to you, Liz, and then ask Nettie what, what you think uh, and, and what your reflections might be about it. Um, but I direct the question to you, because Liz, because I think it has to do with reception. So uh, books tend to teach us both explicitly and implicitly. And I'm curious about what kinds of knowledges you find brought to the fore in um, novels such as uh, Nettie's and, and also the, the distinguished author Octavia Butler, who was celebrated in the last program for the series. Uh, and particularly, how do these fictions teach us about the very long histories of our current climate crisis, the fact that this crisis has been in the making for potentially centuries and has a strong relationship to colonialism? and global capitalism. What, what kinds of teaching of climate justice do you find for your students and for the youth that you work with in these books? This is a great question, thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Before I, I answer those questions, I think it's really important to think about the institutions that I'm working in, right? So, and when I say that, I mean the institution of public education in the United States, um, as well as libraries, and, and their role in shaping ideologies and mythologies uh, within our country, focus specifically on children, right? Three to, you know, 19 years old children. Um, and so the role historically that these institutions have played was to perpetuate ideologies that are uh, in support of dominant cultural norms, of hegemony, of white supremacy culture, right? So when I think then of what uh, Nettie and, and Octavia Butler's work does, it, it, it gives us a chance to um, disrupt those narratives, those myths, in a way that centers folks who are purposely pushed to the margins, right, for fear of, um, you know, ending white supremacy culture, uh, and and allowing uh, kids, uh, specifically BIPOC kids, to see themselves as agents of change. And I always love to bring in Rudy and Sims Bishop's work. And, and if there are educators on this call, you, you might know her for her metaphor for books as being windows, mirrors, and sliding glass doors. But it's not just that we need, she talked about diversity, not just to see other people uh, and, and, and learn through their experiences, but to fight ethnocentrism. So I think there's something incredibly powerful to, um, you know, interrogating the power dynamics of, um, of what, what children are normally exposed to in these institutions and what these institutions were created to do. Um, and here we have these books, these narratives that are, you know, I'm, I, I was telling Nettie earlier, I am such a fan. I, like, I'm over here with like my stack of books, but <laughs> so empowering um, to be able to know that these books are here for us, to know that, you know, kids who are, again, purposely marginalized have an active and important role in using their imaginations and creating these futures where they themselves are the change makers. Yeah, fabulous. Nidhi, did you want to comment? Yeah, I mean, it's a lot. It's a lot. I, I mean, as you've been talking, I've been thinking about things from various points of views, because I'm like thinking about myself as a reader, as a kid, and those things that I did not have 
access to and and those things that I that I kind of needed but didn't didn't get and then you know and that's what led me to start start telling these stories and and then also um the perspective of me as a writer you know as a black woman like all of these different perspectives and, and the roles that those play and then also the role of storytelling and what storytelling does so it's just this is like a there's just so much to to talk about in this issue, like the the role of storytelling and and what what its central um, what its central purpose is in these issues, and, and how how sometimes storytelling can come at these issues from different angles, where it's not directly, where it's like you know, okay, this story is talking about climate change and it's gonna you know it's gonna it's there to rewire your mind it's it storytelling doesn't operate like that storytelling comes at it from the side from the inside from the point of view it sets you there and you experience and then you're you're supposed to meet it halfway so it's like so i've been thinking about all of those things and and how all of those things are are important and yeah it's it's a lot so i'll just leave it at that and let's let's continue because i'm sure some of these things will keep coming up yeah, I loved how you just referred to that as kind of coming at it from the side. And that's why it's just so powerful, you know, um, and in some ways more truth telling happens that way than in direct sort of politicized speech, I think. So um, I, uh, I, I'm i going to quote you, Nettie, um, from uh, the afterword to LaGuardia. And by the way, big shout out to uh, Tana Ford and James Devlin's cover. It was and is a gorgeous cover for that uh, graphic narrative that uh, Nettie wrote, um, and it's my background today. Um, so at the, in the afterword of LaGuardia, Nettie, you write, for quite some time, I've been pondering dystopian narratives and how tired I am of them. Um, I've written my share, but I've begun to feel a strong need to write narratives that even if weird, showcase an optimistic future. So uh, kind of building a little bit on the last question and discussion we had, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you scaffold hope and futures, and particularly for Black youth or other underrepresented youth. Yeah, um, I, I think that's really important. And as you're reading that, I was like, yeah, <laughs> it's been a while since I've read that. But um, yeah, hope is, is like, what what are we if we don't have hope? You know, and, and at one point, I was like looking at these these um, dystopian narratives, and and I'm not even gonna lie. I mean, I love reading them. I love reading them, but there's just like this nihilistic side of me that's like, let me just see everything destroyed. I'm tired of everything. Let's just destroy. So so there's that. But at one point, I just started thinking about the fact that you know, if you see what you're gonna get, you know, and if you only see the destruction if you only see the 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 negativity you're going to get that that's that's really the way these things work that's a fact so and, and it and it came back down to storytelling and the role of storytelling and the power of storytelling because you as a as a creative i'm not always thinking about these things i'm not always thinking about what am i going to do with this like what is this story doing i'm not thinking about that at all but the the need for hope is something that I think about. The need for, okay, these things are happening and these things are in our future. And if we don't do these things, what's gonna happen? Like, I, I started thinking about just this idea of, well, okay, if we'll, we'll specify with climate change. Um, we, we're so focused on the negatives and we're constantly repeating those narratives that like we're not talking about solutions, like possible solutions. And the first thing that comes is imagination. You start thinking about things, you imagine it, and then you create it. Or, or, or you imagine it and then someone else creates it. You imagine it and you speak it, and then someone else gets ideas. It's it's a and so that's that's what hope does, you know? And so I just started thinking about these stories and and how, you know, if we if we start kind of just shifting the needle a bit and 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 looking at things from a hopeful perspective even if it's even if it's not necessarily realistic like don't get stuck on this idea of it has to be realistic oh that's not pot like don't get stuck on that dreaming and imagining and and hoping if you do that 
things will come forth. More things will come forth from that. So I think that that's really the role that that um, that hope needs to play. And when and when I was saying that, when I was saying that we need more narratives that are that are um, that are hopeful. That's what I mean. I, I think that yes, we have the cautionary tales. Those are necessary. We know those are necessary, but we also need to. Uh, we also need those optimistic, um, optimistic points of view and ideas to imagine what would it be like if we solve some of these problems. Because if you can't imagine it, we're definitely not going to get there. I love that. It's hope is almost a form of resistance. You know. Um, yeah. Um, so Liz, I wonder if you could sort of talk about how Nettie's fictions or, or, or Octavia Butler's fictions hit ground with the, the youth you work with and how you're seeing particular youth change maybe by these imaginative possibilities that these books provide. Yeah, I, I, I would love to comment too on what Nettie just said, which is just, I have to mute myself because I'm over here being like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so you'll see me nod my head up and down a lot. But I, I, I just this idea of hope feels so um, radical too, right? And and I, I think as an educator, this this goes into your question too, Stephanie. As a librarian, as an educator, you know, I, I think of hope all the time. I think of hope as wonder and imagination, which you all just. Um, spoke to and, and have its liberatory properties. And, you know, I think of myself as a critical educator. And I think so often criticality and uh, cynicism are linked. <laughs> but criticality is actually, to me, incredibly hopeful. It opens up room and space for this imagination. And so I think about, you know, when I think of Nettie's works, when I when I think of folks out here writing these stories, doing this very important work as our storytellers, um, bringing in that notion of being like these possible futures, um, being critical of where we are maybe right now socially and politically, but not being like, oh, because that, like, like Nettie said, that ends a conversation when we're just like, ah, burn it down, forget it. No, being critical, being aware of ourselves, what we're bringing um, to these narratives, to these stories, and then having that incredibly generative, hopeful, those ideas um, to move us forward. And I hope that's where my the youth I work with, the librarians I work with, the educators I work with, I hope that is what they are <laughs> getting from um, these narratives. Terrific, yeah, and I mean, also there's these sort of parallel ontologies or worldviews that, that you make for us, Nady. I mean, I'm looking right behind me at plant persons, you know, and, and that's actually not just a fiction, but it kind of comes from a different worldview or cosmology in which plants are persons and so sort of being allowed to think through um, cross-culturally uh, how hope might be imagined through cultures that have done so much better with stewardship than mainstream U.S. culture has done. Uh, that's just so powerful. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the status of books and this is sort of a two-part uh, idea. And one is, you know, we all know that there's this very complex media ecology that youth interact with now and that there's a lot of different calls to their attention um, from TikTok and Snapchat and uh, various media forms that are not books. And yet books haven't actually gone away. And I know that um, Liz has done a lot of work on access and access both in relation to economic access to books, but also we're in this newly fervent moment of book banning. Um, so maybe we start with you, Liz, and talk a little bit about where books sit in the larger media ecology and how that relates to access. Yeah. Um, you know, access is, <laughs> I like to think about, well, firstly, having access to books um, 
is different than using books or being able to be responsive to books, right? Like I, I so often I, I think folks think of access as like a, a and, and libraries as a repository um, as opposed to something that's more discursive and dynamic. So I, I don't know, that's just sitting in my, my head um, right now, but um, I think that if so, so, and I'm going to bring my school librarianship hat into this right now and and talk about the importance of school libraries within this role, especially um, in rural and urban school districts, because we know that that is where kids don't have access to school libraries and most likely public libraries um, similarly, and that Let me let me think on this for a second. I'm I'm losing my train of thought because I'm 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 all like wound up. But but Nettie, do you wanna do you wanna say something and set me straight because this I'm so like passionate about this and I'm trying to focus it on on what we're talking about here without going too far off um, to talk about school libraries in general. But so Nettie, you go and then I'm gonna follow up and I I will gather my thoughts. Okay, uh, my my point of view on this is different though because you know um, you know I'm a writer and and I, I have all kinds of thoughts on um, on access. I think about this all the time. I think about the changing dynamics. I think about it all the time, and I don't have any answers. And you you would definitely have more um, more to say on this than me because you know I think about how I grew up because I am a product of libraries. I'm very much, I started reading in a library. The moment where the letters made sense was in a library. I was reading a very hungry, or looking at the pictures of a very hungry caterpillar, and I love bugs. And I was, look, you know, and I'm looking at the words, and the words didn't make any sense to me. I was a, a, a somewhat late reader. The words were like, um, letters always looked like bugs to me. They were always moving around. And then, so I'm looking at those and then at that, there was a moment where they didn't make sense. And then there was a moment where they did. And suddenly I could read. And from that point on, I haven't stopped reading since. So the library for me has always been very central to my being. I was the kid who went into the library and came out with a whole bunch of books. Like I had treasure, you know, they were just the best thing in the world. So, and, and it's always been like that, even through through uh, um, undergrad, through college, the libraries at the university, li like any library, those places were magical spaces for me. You can see that in my work. I have a deep respect for libraries. They are places of power. Librarians are powerful. Um, and, and now I think there's a shifting dynamic, which I, I'm really interested to hear you talk about this because yeah, there's a lot that's competing for the attention of, of kids, a lot. And one thing I will say about books, and it's not because I'm a writer, it's because I'm a fan of books, and I have been since I was, since I could, even before I could read, is that the difference between books and like all the devices and all the things and all the distractions is that books, like sitting down and reading a book, whether it's comics or, you know, graphic novels, whatever, you open that thing and it's static you stop vibrating, you stop vibe, everything gets quiet. And there's something to that that I think kids need. They need that phenomena of being still and reading and, and, and like actively looking at this thing and processing it. They need that. So um, with all the things that are coming around that, that are competing for their attention and their time, I'm worried. I will say that I'm worried. And that's why I want to hear everything that you have to, everything you have to say on this, because maybe you'll bring more optimism to the, to this, but yeah. <laughs> that was really helpful. Thank you. And I also, <laughs> as a librarian, it does my heart, uh, very happy to hear that libraries were those special and powerful and oh. empowering places for you as they should be. Um, so yeah, so I think what you're saying to Nettie is I am not as fearful for okay. books disappearing. I don't, I just, they're not, I'm going to just say that. And maybe I'm being overly hopeful. I just don't see them going away. And part of that and, and even when thinking about them in competition, though, I, I hate, it's not a zero-sum game, 
right? I, this is not a binary. It's not TikTok or a book. Um, and it's not, you know, academia or real housewives, which is my favorite binary. And I live in both those spaces. <laughs> but, you know, um, so I, 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 if you've ever seen a kid, so in Boston right now, which is where I'm located, I'm the director of libraries in Boston, we are opening school libraries. I hope we continue to right now, less than half of our schools have school libraries. When you see children of any age walk into their school library for the first time, and I know we're gonna get to graphic novels in a second, um, and see the excitement for these kids to touch physical books, you cannot convince me that these aren't the incredibly potent vehicles for imagination, for hope, for ideology, for all of the things that books do. I fear when we utilize books in an overly didactic way, just for quote unquote teaching and learning, just to um, be vehicles for, for facts, also big air quotes and information and knowledge, that is where we lose kids. Um, for sure. And I think we see that right now across the country with literacy rates just plummeting across the country. And I think about access to books for pleasure, for self edification, for, and, and you said it earlier, hope and for, for wonder. Um, so I am not particularly worried about books. What I do, what I am worried about are um the political aspects right now that we are in because as i said earlier we know our history the role of school books books that are accessible at school were utilized for a particular narrative to keep folks who look like me in power and mind you folks like me are often in power of library spaces right uh, librarians are 85 percent plus white women like myself so it's really important we do identity work and and and, and understand um, how to be critical and reflective practitioners but i you know i i worry about book bans for sure and I know kids are creative and that is also where media comes in. And we also see a, this, this swing too from the left that then great, Brooklyn Public Library says you're banning books and those books that are being banned, we know these are like queer narratives, these are BIPOC narratives, these are narratives that are not centering those, those dominant cultural norms but there is access to them for kids. We've just got to make sure that the grownups in their lives are matching the kids to the books that they need and not squelching their little baby literacy skills, right? Why are we telling kids that um, graphic novels, and I cannot wait to hear from you about this, Nettie, that graphic novels aren't reading. Shut up. Yes, they are. <laughs> it's those who haven't read them. They, they don't know the scope. That's what, that's where that, it's always, it's always based in, those kind of ideas are always based in ignorance, like flat out, flat out. Yes. And, and when you have these little nascent readers who are just feeling that power that you felt with the hungry caterpillar, like, ah, oh my gosh, what a magical moment. And then there's, you know, a cranky librarian being like, <laughs> that's not a just right book for you. Are you challenging yourself? Is that, that's not reading. That's not going to count in your reading. No, that has to stop. That has to stop. I, I feel like this conversation is so good that I don't want to say too much, but I, let me just, just gently push us even further into the graphic novel conversation or graphic narrative conversation. So as Liz just suggested, you know, even though graphic narrative has a lot more status than it used to, I mean, when I went to graduate school 30 years ago, people didn't do graphic novel studies, and now they do, you know, there's a difference in status, but still, sometimes kids are actually shamed for preferring graphic literature to, to uh, literature without that visual aspect. Um, so I wonder, I'm going to go to you, Nitty, what is it like to work on, on graphic fictions? What, what does that feel like for you? How is it different for you as a writer? 
And how do you balance that media between print media? Yeah. Um, first, I've like I've I've always been a fan of of comics in general. Like um, I, you know, I grew up reading the comics in the newspapers. I would just like gravitate towards those, and I didn't even know why. There was just something utterly intoxicating about that way of telling a story in images and with words. It was just bringing all these things that I loved into one thing. It was just ah, and so I've always loved that. And so like um, writing, writing um, comics and graphic novels is very different from writing a novel per se, you know, like it's, it's, it's far, first of all, it's far more collaborative, which is cool. It's good for like, as a novelist, that's a good exercise for me, <laughs> you know, because as a novelist, you are the God of that whole thing. Like everything is in your control, like everything. So when you're when you're doing comics, it's very collaborative. You're working with especially the illustrator, but you've got the colorist, you've got the letterer, you've got the um, your your editor, and then and so there's that. So it's very collaborative. And then working with um, working with, for example, uh, Tana Ford, my illustrator, like she's freaking genius. First of all, so there's that. And so I'm like, I've got this story, and so then that collaborative thing, you get to get into into the mind of an illustrator which is very different from, you know, my novelist mind. So it's like, it's just, I, I learned so much about storytelling from her. Just, just, just everything's, everything's big. Um, but like kind of back to the, the, the topic of um, the significance of graphic novels and what, what you can do with them. Like as somebody who's written novels and written graphic novels, there are things that you can do in a graphic novel that you cannot do in a novel. And of course, vice versa. And, and like when you're when you're writing the graphic novel, you kind of you you it's just it, your 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 creative world broadens a lot. It has to. It has to because you're working with so many different minds. It's a completely it's a very visual medium. And so so that changes things. And that doesn't just change you know, the story that you're telling it, it, like, it opens it up in a different way, you know, so, so there's that. So, so what's it like writing a graphic novel? Very different. <laughs> it's very different, but at the same time, it's still, you're still telling the story. The story is always, it's, it's just, it's a different medium, but the story, there's that thread. Cause like my graphic novel narratives are linked to my novels. You know, very much so, very much so. certain characters still show up in other ones of my novels. So it's like they're very they're very linked, but it's a it's it's a different type of storytelling. It's definitely a different type of reading, but it is reading. It is reading. It's a different type of reading. You're reading, you're reading the um you're reading the images and the words, but the words flow into the images. It's like a different, it's almost like a, a different language. So so to call to say that that um, graphic not reading graphic novels is not reading. That's just wrong. Like <laughs> that's just flat out wrong. And 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 you can tell really deep, amazing stories in graphic novels and in in comics. You know, just like you can tell deep, amazing stories in novels. They're just it's you're telling them in a different way. Yeah, also huge fan. Um, so, Liz, I, maybe there's one kind of case study, thought, moment, anecdote you could give us of a student coming to reading through a graphic fiction? A million case studies? Okay. You know, we can like, start with maybe two out of the million. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, do, I'll do my best. Um, I, I guess I'm just thinking of a lot of time. I'm, like without sounding too like teachery right now, but I'm 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 gonna I'm wearing that hat. Um, mm -hmm. I think of kids in my experience um, as an elementary school librarian for fifteen plus years. Um, kids who may not have felt like quote unquote readers in the library. Now, I don't think that's the only role of a library, right? I am I am late to reading myself. I really didn't, I always tell people I was about 14 when it all sort of clicked in my head. But Nettie, like you, when that paper came, I was like, 
like, why do I care about Beetle Bailey? I don't, but <laughs> for whatever reason, I could get into that story in a really profound way that I was looking forward to those every Sunday for them to be in color. And then of course, like in the back section, black and white earlier in the week. But so I think of the kids who don't have that identity of reader and then what those graphic novels and comics I'm a big X-Men comic person myself growing up and that still feels very salient to who I am today I think of people in X-Men characters all of the time and their superpowers um so I'm thinking in my head I'm not gonna like two little boys one of them being a black boy who really just I um Jerry Craft's uh, graphic novels when they came out. And of course, I'm being a bad librarian and forgetting the new kid. Okay, someone's going to correct me in the chat if that's not right. Um, like, you know, carrying it around, like just that kid clearly felt like a reader. And, and that is something to be celebrated that that book was, you know, telling a particular story that was important to that child and then making it accessible in a different kind of way to this kid right this kid there are other um books in, in that were in the library that had aspects of those that narrative identity of those characters um but this was the book so i think of it as graphic novels really do open doors and and i really think you know i'm not i still read comics and I read really thick books and thin books and good books and bad books and pulpy books and uh, critical books and academic books. You know, it, it, it's it's just one of the ways I'm a reader. It's just one of the ways kids are readers. And in, in, a, in a lot of instances, I find those are the books that open the door to that child's identity as a reader. Terrific. Um, thank you both so much. Um, I am seeing a huge line of questions from our audience right now. And I'm thinking maybe we should make that switch and let let this be a more democratic and full conversation with all kinds of voices. So um, let me just say, if you have a question you have not submitted yet, please submit it by using the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Please keep the question concise as we'd like to get as many of your voices out there as possible. All right, so I'm going to start. I'm not going to name our questioners because that's not necessarily something they'd want, but I'm going to start with a question that came in really early in this conversation, and this person is uh, directing the question to you, Nady. He says, can you speak on the ways that uh, Afrofuturism and the ideologies and mythologies therein are inspirational as we work to address the threat of climate catastrophe? Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, all right. All right. Um, so there's a whole conversation on Afrofuturism and Netty out there. Um, I'm just going to say Google that and we'll just move on to the next question because, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Um, so the next question I have um, says, um, Again, to you, Nettie. Uh, Nettie, I admire the emphasis you place on education as the key in the search for solutions to social and natural problems. How does this message reach policymakers in Africa, where children have the least number of years of schooling compared to children from other regions of the world, um, correlating with the low ranking of African states and human development index? That's a lot. Uh, wait, that's a lot, man. Um, can you read that question one more time? I've heard education and then absolutely. Um, uh, I'll, I think I'll actually I'll truncate it a bit. Um, yeah. Nadie, I admire the emphasis you place on education as the key in the search for solutions to social and natural problems. How does this message reach policymakers in Africa? Uh, is there a way in which the work, as you understand it, is moving into African nations or communities? Okay, um, yeah, so, okay. It's just hard for my brain to uh, 
contain all that because we're speaking about Africa as a continent, like a, the continent of Africa, which is huge and diverse. And each of those countries has their own specific issues. Like I can't possibly make a statement that addresses every single one of those diverse nations, because even in specific parts of African, specific African countries, those things are different. Those things, like when it comes to um, policy makers, ver various policy makers on the continent of Africa, there are so many different types and there are different types of corruption and different types of success. And all those things depend on those specific countries in those specific places. So um, yeah, education is important. Now, how do we get it there? It will be different depending on where, what part of the continent we're talking about. Fabulous. Um, and here's one that looks like it's geared towards, uh, towards you, Liz. Um, some libraries are getting into addressing some of the kids' basic needs, for example, snacks after school to involve youth any thoughts on this as a good step? And Liz, I think you could certainly talk about your community conversations here too. You did homework, Stephanie. Um, libraries are community centers. I think if you're doing it right, the only, I'm gonna say, give a caveat before I continue though, because so often in public education, um, teachers and librarians are funding their programs um, and are not paid to do these things. And so there is tension there. Um, okay. Yes, you should do that. <laughs> yes, libraries should do that. To me, you know, I think people, there. there's a an idea of like public library, libraries versus school libraries. Um, I, I, I dislike that, that really pits us together. Really, we work together. You should be working with your public library if you're lucky enough to have public library, if you're lucky enough to have a school library, those are th that those are community partners. And I think especially, you know, I, as a school librarian, one of the benefits as a school librarian is that I know my community very well. And, most of my school librarianship was in an elementary school that also had a preschool. So I saw kids for seven years. I saw, meaning I saw whole families, babies being born, older siblings graduating high school. You are a very like deep, or you can be as a school librarian, a deep and important part of the school community who has a long memory of students and their families. So for me, that, you know, something I did that, that Stephanie is referring to is I, I, I had a program in my Cambridge library called Community Conversations. And, you know, school librarians, we were like the bartender or the like, like therapist for the team. Everyone's coming to us. We have the chocolate. You should have chocolate. You should have Advil. You should have water. You should have, you know, menstrual products. Like the th this is you become part of that fabric. So you will also hear like, up, oh, you know, Mr. Johnson's class has lice right now. Great. That you know, because you work in schools, that's very stressful. So we're going to invite the school nurse in. We are going to talk about what that means for your child. Come in, grab a cup of coffee, sit and discuss that. So those conversations all the way to policy, right? What does that mean? We we had state senators and we, we had our mayors and the city council school committee. You know, the library provides a less I, I would like to think the library provides a, 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 a or a, not a less, a more uh, informal, a more casual, um, less like scary place to have a conversation. Um, libraries, I hope again, are, are places of discourse and criticality where we can have these kinds of conversation. And so that invites, um, us to be really important parts of the community. And we are not neutral. And I just want to say that because maybe this sounds like neutrality. It is not. I am not a neutral person. I don't believe that neutrality is tool of the oppressor. No, we are not neutral. 
So we have to be thoughtful about whose voices we are centering and inviting in. Um, but with that said, yes, fe feed those babies, especially if you have money to feed those babies. All right, fabulous. Yeah, you can Google. Um, uh, I believe you were Family Outreach Hero of the Year. That's an award that Liz won. Yeah. Uh, right, right after you Google Nettie Okorafor and the Afrofuturism issues. <laughs> yeah. So here's another uh, kind of comment for you, Nettie, that sounds interesting um, and seems to refer back to a conversation you had with somebody on Twitter before it was X. And this person says, loving the conversation. Um, they go on to ask a little bit more about how we would think about imagining a better future and kind of build that into the educational system. And then they say, P.S. Nettie, thank you so much for the kind hippo prompt many moods ago on Twitter before it was X. It led me to a story about a sunken Nile Delta couple of a, a couple of centuries into the future, imagining my own family's farm submerged. Wow. What was the prompt? Like, um, okay, you're welcome. Excellent. <laughs> Yes. It just spoke to me like I had to bring that to you. I, I obviously someone was very moved by that. Um, <laughs> so here's here's another one. Uh, this is rather long. I'll try to make it shorter. Um, as a teacher who strives to move students past or perhaps beneath the doom and gloom of so much mainstream climate change discourse, I so appreciated what both of you said about hope and the critical radical potential of imagination. I've been noticing, however, that many young people are resistant to engaging in that kind of imagining and, and even hopefulness, even more so now compared to when I was a teacher five years ago. It seems like one of the roots of that resistance is not wanting to engage with their grief, both the grief over what they've already lost and the grief that they anticipate in the future. I'm curious, how do you navigate grief with young people? How do we make space for it, help them process it? And what is the relationship between hope and grief as you understand yeah i think that they are the the re relationship between hope and grief they're like this you know um i think that i i totally understand why a, a kid would would wallow in the hopelessness from the past and then also with the future i totally understand i mean like the more you know it's scary it's scary and i think that um I think that it's important to allow that, allow the the feel the that feeling of hope hopelessness. Like I, I'm not saying to wallow in it, but like one of the things that I, one of the draws for me of reading apocalyptic and post-apocalyptic fiction and narratives is that like sometimes you need to like go in. You need to sometimes to get to the the hope, you have to go into the darkness. You need to look. You need to gaze into the abyss for a while. I think that's I think that is powerful and important. But at the at the same time, I think the balance is that needs to be there of the hope. That's that's why I'm saying those narratives, the hopeful narratives, those the hopeful thoughts, the hopeful ideas need to be there for when you when you turn from the abyss. <laughs> you know, when the kid turns from the abyss just for a second, there needs to be that hopeful thing there. Because those two, the 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 grief and the darkness need to be there with the hope. I, I think those two things, they, they go very much hand in hand. And I think that like that's where the solution is, having both of those things there. So I don't know. Um I, I think that kids should be have that like uh you should let them kind of go in, go in and let them be dark and let them feel all of those hope because that's that's we see what is not being done right now we see what is not being done we see that there are solutions to these issues of of climate we see they are there they are not that difficult um but we're not doing them and we see why and that's a whole other conversation and i'm not going to go into that but we see it and and kids are smart and kids see that too. And so I could see why they just be pissed and disgusted. But the but like like that that balance of of rage and then hope. We need, both of them are necessary. They they need to be like operating together. And I just I I I yes, 
And you're also underscoring the important, this is not, again, this is not a binary and it's the danger of binary thinking. Yeah, uh, yeah. That child might turn away from the abyss that, and also books as, and, and narratives as catharsis to move through that, you know, as a, I am a lifelong New Englander, I need some help sometimes <laughs> in feeling my feelings and expressing my feelings. And, and those dystopian novels the, that, and like the news, you know, like that moves me emotionally, but it is not, I, I will, that, that sort of the radicalized hope is that actionable hope. And it will move me those feelings of maybe despair and grief toward action. And so it is not a binary. And I think so often, even when talking about fiction and nonfiction as a binary, right? And like like cold, hard facts, right? That doesn't allow for a lot of nuance or other feelings to exist when we are expected to think one thing as the quote unquote truth, which is why I think Nettie's work is so important those fictional worlds. It's not that, the, you know, fiction isn't fake, but it's that space to move through, to feel those feelings, multiplicity of feelings, and sometimes feelings that in, in our understanding or how we're taught are at opposition, but really they're working together um, to propel us into to, to action, or I hope so. Yeah, that was, those are really beautiful answers both. I mean, in my own experience, grief also taught me about love and relationship, you know? So um, I think we have time for two more questions from our audience. Um, I find this one interesting. It's a little bit different. Um, this person says, what comes first, freedom of expression through the defense of one's art, whether it's visual, musical, or literary, or the freedom to read? Can you read that one more time? Sure. It's a bit of a, it's a kind of deep philosophy here. What comes first, freedom of expression through the defense of one's art or the freedom to read? Hmm. Freedom of expression. Through, through the def freedom of expression See, that's what I'm getting stuck on. Freedom of expression through the defense of one's art. Um, freedom of expression through the defense of one's art. So it's like you're 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 implying that your art is um is a resistance. It's like the fact of your art is you're you're it's it's you're speaking against something. That's not always the case. Art isn't always, you're not like creating something, it's not always as a response to something. So that's what I'm getting tripped up on. Um, so we're only, are we only talking about that type of art? And, or are we talk, are we defining that as art? Because that is not the definition of all art. Um, and then the free the freedom to read. What and uh, I'm stuck on that too. What does that mean? What is reading to read what? Reading books, um, reading ideas. Like what? What exactly? There's something. Be what's the question? <laughs> yeah. I wonder if it's something like you know, can we can we understand art as a means of getting free before we have access or ability to read? Or does reading somehow open up that possibility that art is a is a kind of mode of liberation? I'm going to paraphrase. That might not be what they're asking, but okay. Um, re the so you, you, your uh, freedom comes from reading. Is is that the imply that freedom comes from reading? Not necessarily. Freedom can come from. I, I'm thinking of like people who are illiterate who never read a book and could, I'm thinking of specifically Fulan Devi, who's the, the, if you don't know who Fulan is, you should look up Fulan. Fulan is amazing. She completely illiterate, but the rage and the draw, like the need for being a free Indian woman, like was just 
in her heart. So um, she didn't need to read any books to to be that be, to be that woman. So yeah, I guess I'm gonna just say the first one. <laughs> I'll go with that. But I, I mean, I'd like to know what the 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 real. I, I just feel like we're not getting at the real question. That was a terrific answer, and I, I agree the question is complex, and I'm not quite sure where it's going. Did you want to comment on that, Liz, or should we move to our last question? I, I'm really excited to look up Fulon to be. Oh, yeah, you should. me too. I, yeah. Yeah, I really <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, we have some loquacious folks and really great intellectual questions, but they're so long that I think I'm going to just find another one that's a bit shorter. Um, so this one says, um, Nettie, for Nettie, do you ever have issues getting your editors or publishers on board with how you want to address or frame the climate crisis? No. And I've had many editors. Um, all my editors have been fantastic. If I had ever had any issue, if I had to like, um, if I had to push back and, 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 convince anybody of any of what I was writing, that's not the right editor for me. So so no, every single one of my editors has been like, they're all just as crazy as me. <laughs> they're all just like, we all think in the same, the same direction. And I haven't had any, any editors um, who have been like, you know, that's that's a little much or you know that's that's really I, I can't really understand what I have never not been understood. Like what, what, like the ideas that I'm presenting never not been understood. It's always been, heck yeah, let's do this every single time. And I've had several, um, several editors. Have I been lucky? Yes and no, because I'm very careful with who I work with. Very choosy. I like it's 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 from the from the very beginning. I've known that I've had to. There are people. Um, that I needed to find my my people. I've always known that when it comes when it comes to editors, I need to find my people, and 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 I I I have, and it's been it's been it hasn't been easy, but I've had to be very kind of intuitive and observant and listen hard. But um, but yeah, I've, I've so far I've chosen very very well. Nettie, we're so grateful for your choosiness and that you did find your people. Um, I'm going to wrap this up, but I just want to say again, this was a really fabulous conversation with two climate justice superheroes who make it really clear to us how important imagination is in what is going to be a really long haul towards what I hope is a better future for all of us. So thank you so much, Nettie Korafor. Thank you so much, uh, Liz Phipps Suero. Um, it's been wonderful to talk with you all, and thank you to our audience. I'm sorry I couldn't get to all your questions. Um, if you want to view this video or the other program in this series, you can do so on the uh, Harvard Radcliffe Institute website. The video should be posted in about one week. So again, thank you so much for attending, and take good care.